God gave us life. He made us, made us for a purpose. We were made for him. The Bible puts the whole equation like this. Everything was made for man. And man is made for God, see. Everything is made for man. Man is made for God. That's the equation. You cannot change that. That's the way things are. Hi, me. Your way. Cover me within your mighty hand. When the ocean rises and thunders roar, I will so. Isaiah 53, 4, 5, and 6. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our, for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Today I want to deal with forgiveness and healing. That is why I read Isaiah 53, verse 4, 5, and 6, because it deals with forgiveness of sins and healing. Now, let's deal with the forgiveness of sins first. To deal with forgiveness of sins, you need to understand the problem of sin. Now, you know, when you want to understand man's real problem, uh, then you got to go to this. And uh, the Bible, you know, I was thinking about it. The Bible, even if, you know, if, if you have never known anything about the Bible, please know this one thing and, and appreciate its contribution to human life today. One thing it has done is, it reveals what human problem is, like no other book in the whole world reveals. There is no other book in the whole universe that reveals what man's problem is other than the Bible. The Bible calls it exactly as it is. The Bible tells us that sin is man's problem. No other book tells us that. If any other book tells us that, that is a book based on the Bible. That's why it tells us that. Bible is the only book. You would have gone to university and studied there and got your doctorate even, you know. No book will ever tell you anywhere in the world that sin is the cause of human problem. Only the Bible tells us. That's why even though you may go to universities and colleges and so on and learn a lot of things out there, 
through the week it's important to come to church on sunday because we tell you what they don't tell you and what we tell you is more important than what they tell you i can tell you that for sure it is more important than what they tell you because they can teach you a lot of things but they cannot teach you this key to success in life the human problem must be understood if you don't understand human problem then how can you understand the cure and how can you be healed and how can you be how can you receive from god the remedy that is available for that sin and how can the problem be ever ever be solved so this is a, this is a very important matter the problem of sin must be understood in the bible if you don't appreciate for anything else must be appreciated for this one thing it makes an extraordinary contribution and that is it tells us what human problem is all about human problem is sin that's the specialty of the bible it tells us it is sin and it tells us the remedy also in the verses 4 5 and 6 i'll bring that out in a minute now the problem is sin we got to first have a diagnosis then only we can treat it right so let's go through the diagnosis the problem is sin dr martin lloyd jones i don't know if you've heard of him he was a great preacher back in the 40s 50s and 60s and uh, he preached in england and wales uh, he was a medical doctor trained a medical doctor as a young man 29 year old man he was already well known and had a harley street practice in london where all the wealthy people go to consult with private doctors you know and he was uh, the assistant to lord hoder who was a very famous medical doctor at the time and who was the queen's doctor dr martin lloyd jones was known for his ability as a as a person who can diag- diagnose diseases and so on and um, he worked with people a lot trying to find out what sicknesses uh, what, what this illness particular illness they're suffering from is and in his experience he says he found out that man's problem is not sickness it's not mental it's not emotional it is not social it is not financial it is not all these other things you know it's not his nerves and it is not his this and that mainly the root of all the problem is sin so he says he talks about how he came to ministry he says the more he practiced medicine he came to find out that uh, the root problem is sin and uh, he ends up talking with people more about sin and uh, salvation and so on because he finds out that's the mother of all the problems so one day he finally decided that he'll just go ahead and be a preacher you know and uh, and talk of bring a real cure to people and he left his uh, medical practice when he entered ministry he was still a young man a very successful doctor very bright future a lot of people knew him so it came out in the newspapers in london that this medical doctor has left medical practice and bright prospects for a great future as a med- medical man and went to wales and in a city uh, became a pastor of a church Uh, in a community full of workers that worked in a coal mine basic workers everybody thought what is he going to do with basic coal miners you know this is a great medical doctor and intellectual uh, what is he going to preach there how is it going to be received there in the end he started uh, bringing many hundreds of people to christ and then later on after about 10 years there uh another great preacher named Campbell uh, G Campbell Morgan who was a pastor of Westminster Chapel was getting very old he was about 85 years old he was near death and so he wanted to find a replacement for him there so he went and searched out Dr Martin Lloyd Jones and brought him and made him pastor of Westminster Chapel which is at the Buckingham gate itself the address is Buckingham gate it's right at the gate of the Buckingham palace and became a very successful preacher his bible studies were attended by 2000 people every friday night back in the 50s late 40s and the 50s bible studies were attended by 2000 people just imagine that years together he taught bible study and then had a sunday morning service where he taught something and sunday evening service we taught another thing one of the greatest preachers of the 20th century uh he talks about the problem of sin as being the mother 
of all the problems. If you get that right, you can correct all other problems he believes. So what is sin? Let's get to the definition of sin. What is sin? If sin is the mother of all the problems, we need to get that right to get the life right, get all the problems in life right. What is sin? Sin is not necessarily committing some great crime, like robbing a bank or killing somebody or committing adultery or some great uh, sin and, 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 and practicing some kind of evil vice or something like that. Not necessarily. All those other things, all those things, criminal activities and vices and, pra and the evil habits, they're all the things that sin gives birth to. They come as a result of sin. If you have sin, then all these things come. But actually sin is not that. Sin is much greater than that. It's at the bottom of that. It's the foundation for these things that happen. What is sin then? Let me define sin. It is failing to give God his rightful place in our lives. He is our creator. We are creatures. Sin is failing to give God his rightful place. The place that belongs to him in our life. What is the place that belongs to him? Number one place. He must be the most important person in our life because, because of him I'm here, I'm breathing, I'm living. He gave me life. He's my creator. Without him, I'm nothing. He made me. So he must have the top priority, number one place in our lives. So sin is a failure to give God the right place in our lives. And also, it is sin is leading our lives in such a way that we don't bring glory to God as His created beings. See, we live and we don't bring any glory to God. We don't live for the glory of God who made us. That is sin. So it is failure to give the right place to God that He deserves as our Creator and the failure to glorify God in every way. That is what sin is, basically. Now, a lot of people in the world are unhappy about Christians because Christians are calling everybody sin, sinner. So they are saying, well, these Christians are bad because they are calling everybody in the world sinners. We are not sinners. We are good people. So let me clarify to those people that are out there watching and, and maybe there are some of them are sitting here. You know, they have always thought that uh, Christians are calling others sinners. Please understand how some of our people have not explained it before, maybe. Let me explain it. We don't mean, you know, that you're a very bad person, an evil person or something like that. You may be a good person in terms of, uh, you know, when you look at it in the worldly sense. What we are saying is there is no place. God does not have his rightful place in your life. That's sin. And you don't glorify God by your life. That is what sin is. You see, sin is leading your life as you like, having no place for God and living for your own glory and for your own sake. You're living for your own sake. And that is what sin is. Bible defines sin in that way. And you can understand very well how that is the root cause of all problem. God gave us life. He made us, made us for a purpose. We were made for him. The Bible puts the whole equation like this. Everything was made for man. And man is made for God, see. Everything is made for man. Man is made for God. That's the equation. You cannot change that. That's the way things are. All right. So this is what sin is. Now, if that is what sin is, and that is, the, that is at the bottom of all the problems that human beings have, you know, psychologists and sociologists and scientists and, and so on, they give so many wonderful names now for all the difficulties that people have. You know, if somebody is stealing, they give a nice fancy name, you know. Why they, why he's saying stealing? So the guy who steals doesn't even understand, you know, what this is all about. They give him that name. So you got this problem, you know. So he goes and thinks it's a very fashionable thing to have this uh, fancy sounding a disease, you know. He says, I got this disease, you know. The doctor tells me that's the disease I have and that's why my hand is not staying with me and I'm reaching out and putting things in my pocket, you know. I can't resist it, you know. If a man is lying, they've got another name for that, you know. Even if you're afraid, they've got a name for it. And if you're confused, there's another name for it. And 
they, they, they've made, you know, these things, man's problems look very fancy and, and good, but behind all of these things is the problem of sin. All right. The Bible reveals that man's problem is sin. The Bible also reveals the remedy for man's problem. The remedy is the death of Christ the sh through the shedding of blood on the cross of Calvary. All right. The cross, in essence, is the remedy. When I say cross, I'm not talking about the cross that hangs around our neck or on top of the church building. We have one on top of our building. Uh, I don't mind that. Fine, wear it, put it on the church building. That's no problem. But I'm not talking about that cross. I'm talking about the cross where Jesus died, where his blood was shed, the cross which was used as an altar for the sacrificed uh, to be uh, killed so that our sins may be forgiven. That's the cross I'm talking about. All right. And the Old Testament, one of the earliest verses that describe the cross very clearly, prophetically. You know, maybe you have not thought about it as a prophetic verse, but once again, let's go to it. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. We started with that verse in the first week itself. Verse, chapter 17, verse, verse 11 says this. The whole teaching in chapter 16 and 17 of Leviticus is about the day of atonement. Atonement means to bring man and God together. That's what atonement. To make these two people who are separated because of a problem, that's a problem of sin, bring them together. Chapter 16 and 17 is about the day of atonement and how they should go about uh, doing things on the day of atonement to bring to make atonement for the sins of the people. And so he's talking about uh, the shedding of the blood, the killing of the uh, animal, sacrificial animal, and so on. It is all a picture of Christ and what he will do later on. So in that context, he talks about the blood, and he says this, for the life of the flesh, God is instructing Moses, and he says, the life of the flesh is in the blood, God says. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. Look at the word atonement. To make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Now why do, I, why do I call it a prophetic scripture? What is so prophetic about it? It is not talking about someone's blood or some animal's blood. Sure, the whole chapter is talking about how animal's blood must be carefully handled and you cannot eat it and so on because the blood is meant for some other purpose, to be taken on the altar and sprinkled upon the altar to make atonement for the sins of people. But ultimately, it is really talking about the blood of Jesus, really. That is why I say this is a prophetic verse. When God says, the life of the flesh is in the blood, it is very clearly prophetic. It is not talking just about our life or life that is in the animal whose blood is shed at that time. No, he's talking about the blood of Jesus. When Jesus came as a man, the blood that flowed in his body carried the very life of God. The life of the flesh is in the blood. We carry life in our blood. It's true. But we carry the life that come from our mother and father. It is already stained with sin. It is not perfect. It is a sin-mixed blood. But Jesus was not born with the Father's help. So his blood did not come from his mother and father. It came from God himself. That is why Paul says it, uh, talking to the Ephesian elders in his final departure from there, before he goes to Rome, he says, take care of the church, he tells the elders, who God bought with his own blood, how can he say with his own blood? Only Jesus' blood was shed. He says, God brought with his own blood because the blood that was in Jesus when he was in the flesh is the blood of God himself. So it's about the blood of Jesus. That is why that blood is powerful. Why is it so powerful? Because it is sinless blood. It is the blood, it is the blood that came from God. Why it is so powerful? Because it has the life of God in it. That's why it's so powerful. God's life is flowing through it. When it was shed, God's life was poured out for us so that we may have life. He is giving his life to us. 
Because our life has been stained and ruined by sin. He is giving his life so that we can have his life. This is why when you take communion, we take it saying, and then back in those days when we took communion, somebody came and administered it individually. And they always said, this is the blood of Jesus shared for you. Was I drinking the blood? No, I was not drinking the blood. I was just drinking the grape juice. But they said, this is the blood of Jesus that was shed for you. What are they saying? You're literally partaking of the very life of God by believing in the blood of Jesus. That's exactly what they're saying. You know, maybe we should start saying that again. As we administer even collectively together, it's possible to do that. You know, this is the blood of Jesus that was shed for you. What are we saying? We're saying the life of God was poured out through the blood of Jesus. And you by believing in the blood of Jesus and by being washed by the blood of Jesus, the life of God himself is available to you. Now you're not only washed by the blood of Jesus, you drink the blood of Jesus in the sense that you partake of that life so that the very life of God, that Zoe life, in Greek it's called Zoe, the life of God, is flowing in you. The life, the quality of life is God's life. That is what is flowing in you. So the Leviticus 17, 11 is not like what you think. It's not an ordinary verse. It's a prophetic verse. It's talking about the blood of Jesus, how so special it is. He carried the life of God in his flesh. And more importantly, it says, I have given it. God is speaking there to Moses. He says, I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. In other words, he says, blood is appointed to bring man and God together, to make atonement, to reconcile man with God. It must be shed. Otherwise, man who is separated from God due to sin can never come back to God. I have given it to you upon the altar. Which altar? On the cross. I have meant it to be spilt on the altar of Calvary. So that atonement could be made really for you. So that people can come back to God. See how prophetic that verse is. Only with, with Christ the whole, that whole verse can make meaning. Otherwise, it will be just simply about the animal that was killed and the blood that was shed. And it is not about that. That Jesus was the sacrifice. It is his blood that was shed upon the altar. This whole thing about Leviticus 1711. This whole thing is about Jesus Christ. Lord, 
you more than enough for me Everybody say that, confess that Lord, you're more than enough for me Lord, you're more than enough for me Let's just raise our hands and say that Lord, Lord, you're more than enough for me Now you are more than enough for me. So 